morning everyone i am here in lairwick after a long journey here in shetland um just came uh off or rather my vehicle just came off of this freighter and i was on uh that ferry uh just before we had to go on separate ships because there wasn't enough room for my car but here i am so let's have a quick look at the journey that got me here <music> Now, the last time I made this journey, about a year and a half ago, it was, well, close to Christmas time, and everything was black as pitch in Aberdeen and in other northerly latitudes, so really didn't get a chance to see much of the city as we headed out. This time, of course, we could see just about everything. Even though I haven't spent much time in Aberdeen, I really have only just arrived in time to catch my ferry the last two times. This time around when I come back, I'm going to spend some time in this city because I've heard very good things about it. So let's have a quick look at Aberdeen before we make our way to the first stop on our journey, which is not Shetland, but Orkney. Now it is possible to fly into Shetland and a lot quicker and a lot more straightforward to do it that way, but it also costs a hell of a lot more money. And people who live in Shetland and aren't necessarily pulling in gigantic salaries, well, they can't afford to do that every time they head down to Scotland. So uh, this is the way that many people make this journey on a regular basis. And by the way, this is 14 hours of time invested in getting from Aberdeen to Lairwick, Shetland. An amazing odyssey that I have to say is very difficult, especially if you don't have a cabin and all you have is an airplane-like chair to sleep in. So 
So the first leg of the journey takes about five hours and terminates in Orkney. Orkney is another chain of islands that is actually radically different from Shetland. Very flat, apparently very good cattle grazing land, good farming country, and a place where many tourists make their first stop as they're exploring the islands of the UK. These islands have been inhabited for thousands of years. They actually have some Neolithic stone circles that predate Stonehenge on some of these islands. I can only imagine what motivated people to make this incredible odyssey to settle here in this cold, windswept place to try to eke out a living. To say that Shetland is sparsely populated is an understatement in the extreme. This is Lerwick, the only town of any considerable size in the whole island chain, and it has less than 7,000 residents. And the entire island chain has just under 23,000 people, so we're talking just under one third of the entire population of this chain of islands resides in this one town. Down. For the vast majority of the Middle Ages, Shetland was the possession of the Kingdom of Norway and was only handed over to the Kingdom of Scotland as the result of the payment of a dowry. So this island chain has a lot of Norwegian influences. You can see it pretty much everywhere that you travel. Politically, this chain of islands also tends to break with the rest of the UK in terms of what they vote for. They are primarily members of the Liberal Democratic Party, or the Lib Dems, which the vast majority of the UK is not, and also they overwhelmingly voted to remain in the European Union during the whole Brexit thing. So yes, we're talking about a region of the country that is very different different in many respects in their beliefs, language, background, everything is quite different in this region of the world compared to the rest of the UK.
This is a cruise ship owned by National Geographic called the Endurance. Now, the Endurance is one of 19 cruise ships that travel some of the wildest and most remote parts of the Earth. As you can see, it's smaller than your average cruise ship, doesn't pull much of a draft, making it a little bit more appropriate for a harbor of this size because it's not a giant harbor and it's not a giant town that's very well equipped to handle enormous numbers of cruise goers. I think that it would kind of ruin this island chain if we had huge carnival cruise line ships arriving here with tens of thousands of people on board. Let's hope that that doesn't become a reality in Lerwick because frankly, I think this town is lovely the way it is and with the amount of tourism it currently handles, I think it flourishes pretty well. And we don't want to see it overwhelmed the way that a lot of Caribbean islands are these days. Now the journey is far from over when you arrive in Lerwick. You have to take another ferry over to the island of Yell and then another ferry from Yell to Unst. So yeah, an amazing amount of traveling that one has to do in order to get to your destination. Total amount of time is about 16 or 17 hours overall. So the last time I was here, the launch facility was little more than a series of concrete pads and a lot of plans and CGI drawings. How much has the launch facility actually changed in the meantime? Well, have a look. This is the first stage of the RFA-1 preparing for its next static fire, which will be its first nine engine static fire. This rocket has approximately quadruple the capability of the Rocket Lab Electron. It stands 30 meters tall, which is the limit of the size of rockets that are supposed to be launched out of this facility, and it can carry up to one and a half metric tons worth of cargo up to sun synchronous orbit again over quadruple the capability of the rocket lab electron and what you're looking at right now is the hangar or integration facility for the spaceport and this is where all of the payloads on board this particular rocket the rfa1 are going to be integrated into the fairing and eventually stacked on the rocket following the nine engine static fire now i'm not sure if they're actually going to conduct a stack prior to that or just do the static fire with the first stage alone I think probably it'll be a static fire with just the first stage once again I'm not entirely familiar with all of RFA's plans they are being understandably cautious with this their first and possibly most important launch although many people are expecting this rocket to fail on its first flight as most first rockets do keep in mind that with space SpaceX, the first three Falcon 1 flights ended in failure before they finally got it right. 
right, and RFA is well prepared for a similar series of tests. However, a lot of people seem to be talking as if a success is possible with this first launch, and given the amount of work that's gone into it, and given the amount of professionalism that I have noticed amongst the staff that I've met here, and I'm staying in the same place in the spaceport that these people are living in, so really I've had an opportunity to just observe the kinds of people that they've employed, very young and very talented individuals who I think stand a really good chance of seeing success on the first try, or at least success in the long term. So there we are. I'm here at the spaceport, and I'm going to be bringing you a lot more details in the future because I don't plan to leave here until things start happening with this rocket. So please stay tuned. Thank you so much for your support in getting me up here. I'm going to be recognizing more folks in my next video, but I am on my way to another meeting here very soon. So got to get on board with things. So in the meantime, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, stay angry about space.